Okay, so let's see. I've lost track here. Is is are my is my screen up? I see it. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. So um, we were talking about the three dimensional isotropic harmonic oscillator with the complete set of commuting observables chosen to be the Hamiltonian, the total angular momentum squared, and the z component. So that's going to be our, the basis that we choose. We know that if we have a complete set of commuting observables, we can always choose a basis corresponding to it. And so our states are going to be labeled by N, L, and M. And we're interested in working in position space, so we're working with the wave functions in spherical coordinates for those states, those stationary states, which we can also write, this is just notation, as psi N, L, M are theta and phi. And then as usual, when we have rotational invariance, we split it up into a radial part and a spherical harmonic part. The spherical harmonic parts we know, those are known once and for all from the theory of angular momentum. And so we're really trying to find the RNLs and there we did a series of changes of variables. So for review, let's summarize what those are. So first we defined B, and we did this for the ordinary harmonic oscillator too. B is just a length scale, which is square root of h bar over the, um, over mu times omega. And Curly E is a dimensionless version of the energy eigenvalue, which we define to be 2E over h bar omega. Okay, so those, those definitions are made in order to make things be dimensionless in the following way, that the radial wave function is going to be U over R, on the U, I'm leaving off the labels N and L just to try to make things not be so cluttered. But then we did another change of variables for U and we rewrote this as E to the minus R squared over 2B squared times Y. And furthermore, we redefined R in terms of what we called X. So X is R over B. Okay, so we did this, this series of changes of variables. And when we get the answer, we're going to have to, we're going to have to refer to this little table right here to know how to translate back into what we really want. What we really want is, is these radial wave functions. But these changes of variables are to make things simpler to solve. And indeed, what we found was a nice differential equation, which says two derivatives of y with respect to x minus 2xy prime plus the quantity curly E minus 1 minus L times L plus 1 over x squared times y equals zero. Okay, and this is Schrodinger's equation in disguise. So by making the change of variables, normally Schrodinger's equation has h bar in it, but we've made that sort of disappear by hiding it. Where is it hidden? It's hidden within curly E's definition and B's definition. Okay, and so we've gotten rid of all dimensionful quantities. If we choose an energy and we choose an angular momentum, then we can solve this differential equation and then work our way backwards to get the radial wave function. Okay, so we have to solve that differential equation. And 
For the record, I'll put this in parentheses, we secretly know two things about it, which we talked about last time. So we secretly know, first of all, that y is going to be a polynomial. That's a big deal because looking at that differential equation, you wouldn't necessarily know that y has to be a polynomial. And we knew that because we knew that when you write the solutions to the isotropic harmonic oscillator um, in terms of the other basis, the XYZ basis, it was a product of Hermite polynomials. And when you translate that into spherical coordinates, it will still be a polynomial. So that's one thing we know. And the other thing we already know secretly is that curly E has to be two times a non-negative integer plus three. And again, that was from looking at the solution in the XYZ basis. But I'm putting that in parentheses because we're gonna pretend for the rest of today, uh, until the time comes, we'll, we'll pretend we didn't know these things and then we'll see if they indeed work out. Okay. So now we have to solve this differential equation. I'll draw a box around it. That's what we're trying to solve. And we're going to try a solution of the following form that y is going to be x to some power times an infinite series in x. So we're just doing a power series expansion in x. P stands for power here. And so we're allowed to have any coefficient for each power times x to the power p. Okay, and then we brought out front here, we brought out a power of x to the q. Okay, and so that's just because it, it isn't necessarily true from what we know that it starts at power x to the zero, and in fact, it won't. Okay, and so here, um, what we are gonna say is that C zero is not zero. The reason we say that is because if C zero did equal zero, that means we're just starting from a different power here and we stood, should have rearranged things and chosen a different Q. Okay, and the other thing we know is that Q is positive. And the reason we know that is because when you take um, r goes to zero, that's the same thing as x goes to zero. And if there were a negative power of x, that would mean y would not go to zero, it would, it would blow up and we can't have that. So we want y to be finite uh, as x go, as r goes to zero. So we can't have q have be negative. Okay. So now we have this, we have this guess for a solution and we're just going to plug it right into this and see what happens. So before just plugging it in, it's useful to do some preparation. So I'm going to call this preparing to plug in. And the preparation consists of computing all the derivatives that we're gonna need. We're gonna need the second derivative, we're gonna need the first derivative. We're also really gonna need the first derivative times x. So we'll wanna prepare by computing that. And we're gonna want y divided by x squared. And so we're gonna pre-compute all of these things before we try to plug in. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. So first, y double prime is equal to, there's an infinite sum, there's the coefficient c sub p. I'm pulling the x sub q in there. And so I really have x to the p plus q, but then I'm taking two derivatives. The first derivative pulls down a factor of p plus q and the second derivative pulls down a factor of p plus q minus one. And then I have x to the p plus q minus two. 
Okay, so that's one thing we need. Another thing we need is x times the first derivative. Okay, so that's sum again from p equals zero to infinity, c sub p. When we take the first derivative, we pull down a factor of p plus q. And then we have x to the p plus q minus one, but then we're multiplying by this x. So that's just going to give x to the p plus q again. Okay, so that's good. We've pre-computed that for getting ready to plug in. But now it turns out to be useful to do a little trick. And the little trick is to relabel p to p minus 2. So let me do that and then explain why it's a good idea. So if we relabel p goes to p minus 2, now we should start our sum at p equals 2 instead of 0. And we change c sub p to c sub p minus 2 and p plus q into p plus q minus 2. And x to the p plus q is x to the p plus q minus 2. OK, now why was that a good idea? The, the answer is because on the y double prime, we had an x to the p plus q minus 2. And so by doing this relabeling trick, we're also making this have an x to the p plus q minus 2. And so when we add them together, they will have a common factor. That's the motivation or the reason behind this trick. OK, and so in fact, we're going to want to do that with all the contributions that we're going to plug in. Here's our differential equation. So we've done this. We've done this one now. We've done this one now. And we have y over x squared, and we have y, and we're going to want to write them the same way. OK, so let's do y. y, we already have. That's what we started with. But we're going to do the same relabeling trick. OK, so oh, wait. Let's go back to the previous relabeling trick. We're not quite done with this, actually. So now that we've relabeled it, we can change the summation even to write this as sum p equals 0 to infinity of the same exact thing. So that means what I've done is I've plugged in an extra two terms. I've plugged in a p equals 0 term and a p equals 1 term. Right, which I'm not allowed to do, that's cheating unless the corresponding coefficients are zero. So we're just going to define that c of negative two and c of negative one are both zero. So that's going to be important later, but that's necessary in order to go from this sum to where I've looks like I've added in two extra terms, but I haven't actually added in two extra terms because the two extra terms are just zero. OK, so now we're going to do the same relabeling trick for y. And when you do that, you get some p equals 0 to infinity, c of p minus 2, x to the p plus q minus 2. So I'll write here, same relabeling trick. Again, the idea is that they all have, that we want them all to have the same powers of x. And then finally, we need a y over x squared. And there we don't need a relabeling trick. That's already in the form that we want. It's just c sub p times x to the p plus q minus 2. OK, so no tricks needed there. And now we plug them all in. OK, and so we have a sum from p equals 0 to infinity. They all had a common factor of x to the p plus q minus 2. That was the result of our tricks. And now we just need to gather up all the coefficients multiplying that, which turns out to be 
C sub B, P plus Q times P plus Q minus one, minus two P plus Q minus two times C sub P minus two, plus curly E minus one, C sub P minus two, minus L times L plus one, C sub P. All of that, when we add it up, has to be zero. Okay, so now, as a result of our trickery of pulling out this common factor, that means that everything in the square brackets has to vanish for each P. And the reason for that is because the sum of this has to be zero, but the different powers of x are independent. And so if I chose, for example, p equals 13, then the coefficient would be x to the, thir to the 11 minus 2, right? And there's nothing from any other power of x that can possibly cancel that. And so the whole thing multiplying it must be zero. So now we can, we're, we're dividing and conquering. Now we can make this thing vanish for each value of P separately. So let's start with P equals zero. That's the first value of P that we have in our sum. Okay, and so when we plug in P equals zero into that expression, we get C zero times Q times Q minus one minus L times L plus one has to equal zero. Notice that one thing that happened there is when we're plugging in P equals zero, this vanishes and this vanishes because we defined C of negative two to be zero. So recall C minus two equals zero. We defined it that way when we did our relabeling trick. So that's why this thing doesn't depend on curly E. And now this is a quadratic equation. This must equal zero because another thing we chose is we said C zero could not be zero. Okay, and so that's a quadratic equation that's easy to solve. And the solutions are, Q is equal to minus L or Q is equal to L plus one. Since it's a quadratic equation, there are, there are gonna be two solutions and that, that's what they are. Okay, so now the first solution we actually get to reject because that would give Q negative. And we already decided that Q negative, that would make Y going like X to the minus L, which would mean R sub NL goes like one over R to the L plus one as R goes to zero. And that's not finite. And so that's not a good solution. Okay, and so that eliminates one of our two solutions and that means the other solution must be the one that we physically are interested in. The first solution is actually fine as a solution of the differential equation, but physically it doesn't make any sense for the wave function to blow up at the origin. Okay, so now what we do is we take the fact that we now know what Q is. Once we've decided on the angular momentum, we know what Q is. And then we can plug that into making this whole thing vanish. Okay, and so I'm gonna say plug in. We're really plugging in Q. Okay, and rearrange the terms and what you get is C sub P times P plus two L plus one times P has to equal C of P minus two times two P plus two L minus one minus curly E. 
So that's an equation that our coefficients have to satisfy for all p greater than or equal to one. We've already done p equals zero. And again, remember c minus two equals c minus one. We defined those to be zero. Okay, so this is a recurrence relation or recursion relation. I can never decide which is the right word, but recurrence or recursion. And so now we're just going to continue on looking at different values of p and plugging them in and solving them. So we've already done p equals zero. The next thing to do is p equals one. Okay, and so we plug in p equals one, we get c1 times 2l plus two has to equal c minus one here, which is zero times who cares because it's zero. So this equals zero. 2l plus two cannot vanish because we know l is zero, one, two, three, et cetera. And so that's telling us that C1 is actually zero. So now that we know what C1 is, notice this recursion relation relates things that differ in P by two. And so if I know that C1, if I plug in P equals three, then C3 is gonna zero, be zero. And then if I plug in P equals five, and I use the fact that C3 is zero, I'm gonna get that C5 is zero. And in fact, all the odd C's are going to be zero. So what we've learned from that is that all the odd C's we didn't need to bother with. One at a time, we just pick them all off and we get zero for all of them. So, so we only really needed the C's for even subscripts. And so let's let capital C sub J equals little c of 2J for each J, zero, one, two, et cetera. And let's define P to be two times J plus one. Okay, then our expression for Y, we can plug in. So first of all, we're gonna plug in Q is L plus one. That means the prefactor is X to the L plus one. And then our sum over P becomes a sum over J of capital C sub J X to the two J. Okay, and then the last thing we're going to do with this is we're going to plug in for P in this expression and write the little c's in terms of the capital C's using this. And so our recursion relation turns out to be C sub J plus one equals 4J plus 2L plus cur three minus curly E over two times j plus one times two j plus two l plus three. All of that multiplying c sub, capital C sub j. Okay, so the, the whole story of this is really just a big uh, enterprise in changing variables and, and renaming things along the way to make things hopefully sim simpler. So this is our new recurrence relation. It's equivalent to the old one, recurrence or recursion. And it just says, if we know one of the coefficients, then we know the next coefficient. And so we know all of them. Okay, now here's where it's a good idea to go back to the fact that the series must terminate. We know that for two reasons. Either one of them would be good enough. But here are the, are the two reasons. The first one we've already mentioned. 
we already know from looking at the nx, ny, and z complete set of commuting observables basis that y is a polynomial. Okay, but if we didn't know that, we could look at what happens for large j. In other words, terms that are way off in the series. Okay, for large j, if we take our recursion relation here and we just look at this messy coefficient and we say, oh, for large j, this stuff doesn't matter. And j and j plus one are basically the same. And 2j plus 2l plus 3 is basically the same as 2j. And so that means for large j, cj plus 1 is approximately cj divided by j. And so y is going to go approximately like l to the x to the l plus 1. Sum from j equals, doesn't matter what happens at small j up to infinity x to the 2j over j factorial. The j factorial comes because every time we are dividing by the next j, that's why each time we're adding another power of that j in the denominator when we go from j to j, from j minus one to j. Okay, and that means that's approximately x to the l plus one, e to the x squared. And that will, blows up, that will blow up if it's an infinite series. We saw an almost exactly the same thing when we did the ordinary harmonic oscillator. It's the same idea. And again, the idea is we have to avoid this. We can't have this wave function blowing up at large x because that's far from the origin. And far from the origin, the potential is trying to tell us the particle shouldn't be theirs, whereas this is trying to tell us that it, there's an infinite probability for it to be there. So we don't want that. And the only way out is the series can't be an infinite series. It has to terminate. And if it terminates, that's another way of saying it's a polynomial. OK, so just rewriting in words, or in what, words and one equation, what we've just learned. For some k, the answer has to be y equals x to the l plus 1. We're again summing over j, starting from 0. But now we're only going up to k instead of infinity. OK, and we're rewriting things in terms of the capital Cs rather than the little Cs. Okay, and so by only going up to k instead of infinity, it's a polynomial. All right, now for that to happen, what has to happen is that c of k plus 1 must be 0. For whatever that k is. And that means if we go back to a, our recurrence relation here, and we plug in j equals k, the only way of ck plus 1 is going to vanish is if the numerator here vanishes. And so that, that must be true. OK, so for ck plus 1 has to equal 0. That means the numerator of the recursion relation must vanish for j equals k. OK, and so if we look back at what that means, we plug in j equals k, and we find out what curly E is. Curly E is equal to 4k plus 2l plus 3. And if we look at what that means in terms of the ordinary energy, that means the ordinary energy is equal to h bar omega times 2k plus l 
plus three halves. Okay, I've just taken this, I've divided by two and multiplied by h bar omega. And so we found the energy eigenvalues. Okay, but we already knew what the energy eigenvalues are. And so now that means the 2k plus L must equal what we used to call N. And what we used to call N was the sum of Nx plus Ny plus Nz. And everything fits because 2k plus L is an integer, and so is N. This is some integer greater than or equal to zero. All right, so in everything that we do, we can always trade the label N for the label K. They contain the same information because if you know one, you know the other. But so what we've done is we've related the energy eigenvalue N that goes into here to the degree of the polynomial that is the radial wave function. See, k is the degree of this polynomial in x squared. Okay, so conceptually they're different even though we know that they are related. This is the energy eigenvalue label. And k is the degree of the radial wave function polynomial. Well, actually, after we factored out yeah, by our change of variables, so after factoring out uh, r to the l and an e to the minus r squared over 2b squared, those were included in our change of variables. Okay, now in any case, now that we know what curly E is, we can go ahead and simplify our recursion relation because we can plug it in right there in the recursion relation and rewrite our recursion relation one more time in an even nicer, simpler way. Rewrite recursion relation. And it turns out to be capital C of J plus one equals two times J minus K over two times J plus one, two J plus two L plus three times the preceding C sub J. So notice one thing that happened is rewriting it in this way makes it obvious that once j becomes k, this becomes zero, and the next coefficient will be zero. And that's telling us that indeed the series terminates. Okay, so let's, it's probably a good idea to stop every once in a while and review as to what all of this is telling us. So first of all, we're looking for our stationary state wave function, which I used to call psi NLM, but now I'm calling it psi KLM because K and N have the same information, so I can label it either way. Okay, but it's a radial wave function. Again, I'm labeling it by K instead of N, just for variety. But N is equal to 2K plus L, E is equal to H bar omega, N plus three halves. And looking at all the changes of variables we've made and undoing them, R of KL is equal to R over B to the L times our polynomials, which I'm now calling P, The reason I'm not calling them Y is because I factored out the L plus one. 
here. And then there was also the exponential part. Okay. And so just for the record, what are the p's? I'm writing them as a function of x squared. x squared is the same thing as r squared over b squared. And they are sums j equals 0 to k, capital C sub j, x to the 2j. Okay, and now, just because we've made so many change of variables, let's make another one. This is really for convenience. Let's let x squared be equal to z. So this is a polynomial, in, an even polynomial in x, which just makes it a polynomial in z. And now we can just go ahead and compute the lowest few using our recursion relation here. We're just going to keep plugging into that. All right, so the lowest few polynomials. And each one of these I'm going to write in terms of the coefficient c0. So first of all, there's p0l. Okay, and that's just c0 because c2 is equal to 0 if k is equal to 0. Okay, that was too easy. Let's do P1L of Z. That's C0 plus C1Z. And now you can solve for C1 and write it in terms of C0, and that factors out and gives you C0 times 1 minus 2 over 2L plus 3 times Z. All right, and now you can just keep going. P2L of Z is C0 plus C1Z plus C2Z squared. You have to solve for C1 and C2, plug them in, and you get C0 1 minus 4 over 2L plus 3Z plus 4 over 2L plus 3, 2L plus 5 times z squared. Okay, and then I think I do one more in the notes, but we can stop there. That's the idea. But notice when we solve for C1 and C2, the solution depends on what L is. So this C1 is not the same thing as that C1. And notice they're differing by a factor of two. And this C2 is certainly not the C2 from here, which was zero. OK, so these polynomials are actually famous, and they have a name. These are called associated or sometimes generalized Laguerre polynomials. Except that nobody can actually agree on what's the definition, the precise definition of the associated Laguerre polynomials. So I'm going to choose one definition that somebody picked that I happen to like. And that is the following. So the PKL of Z is going to be def defined to be the Laguerre polynomial with subscript K and superscript L plus one half, that's not a power, that's a superscript of Z. Okay, if we choose the coefficient correctly to agree with the convention, and that coefficient is somewhat improbably, C0 equals the gamma function of K plus L plus three halves, divided by k factorial, divided by gamma of L plus 3 halves. OK, and so I need to tell you what the gamma functions are or remind you of that. 
So the gamma function of u is defined to be an integral from zero to infinity dt of t to the u minus one e to the minus t. And it satisfies some nice properties. First of all, gamma of n is equal to n minus one factorial if n is an integer. More generally, gamma of u is equal to u minus one times gamma of u minus one. So these are just definitions. And then gamma of a half is a sometimes useful value and that happens to equal square root of pi. Okay, so the idea here is somebody a long time ago decided this would be a good choice for C0. That's completely arbitrary. We could absorb that into a redefinition. Okay, and so now I need to warn you that if you try to look up in some other source, the associated Laguerre polynomial, you have roughly a one in three chance that that source will agree with the definition I've made. Because the definition I've made, I chose my definition to agree with Wolfram's Mathematica because I use that a lot. But that definition, LK alpha of Z, as defined here or by Wolfram, is equal to one over gamma of k plus alpha plus one times the definition made by some other books. And then there are still other books that define it this way, minus one to the L over gamma of k plus alpha plus one. And then they change the subscripts and the superscripts. And so this is L of k plus alpha, alpha of z. So this is the definition made in still other books. And so if you're comparing sources, there's a very good chance that the formulas will look wrong, but it's because of different, three different definitions, at least three different definitions that I know of, of the associated Laguerre polynomials. So one of them, one of them just differs by a normalization, the other differs by a normalization and a relabeling of the subscripts. So that's just the way things go sometimes. I'm sorry. Any, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I got, I got lost here. What yeah. were the K and alpha term? What were these K and alpha? What's, what's the alpha? So alpha is just the superscript. In our case, alpha is going to be L plus one half in the case we're doing right now, but I'm writing it for general alpha just because it's defined for general alpha. That's one reason. And then next week, we're going to do the hydrogen atom. And in the hydrogen atom, the same functions are going to arise, but with a different set of superscripts and subscripts. Okay, okay. so, yeah, I'm and trying K, to... And K was the degree of the poly... K is the degree of the polynomial. That's one reason I like this definition better than this one, because to me, it makes sense to have one of the subscripts and superscripts be the degree, telling you the degree of the polynomial, rather than here, where you have to do some arithmetic and sub subtract the superscript in order to get the degree of the polynomial. So I'm sorry, I'm just a little bit slow in math. Um, I'm trying to relate these to those, uh, to the actual polynomial, uh, to the, you know, okay, so you wrote out C naught. And then so, I don't know, I'm trying to relate how this P is equal to the L term. So it's, a, it's defined by this formula. Yeah, that's, I'm trying to relate those to the ones you wrote earlier. Uh, right, so there's, there's nothing really to relate because it's a definition. This is just a definition. Okay, the polynomials I wrote are defined to be these where we choose C0 to be this. So that's really sort of all there is to it. Okay, so like for example, when you have like P 
P1J equals C not 1 minus 2 over 2L over 3 times C. And then you had like P2J. Yeah, those. Those. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to see where that L would come in. Where this L would come in? Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. The big L. The big L. The formula you wrote for L. I'm trying to relate it to those P's. I'm a little bit so, slow with math. So again, the only relation is this. This is the this is the definition. There's nothing deeper about it or there's nothing else I can show you that tells you what the relationship is. This is the relationship. How are there's, those L's? There's I'm nothing else I can work out for you or or anything like that. It's that's the definition. So those Z terms are the L's, is that what it is? Z terms are the L's. The Z, the Z, the Z, like the, the, the Z, the Z squared. So these are the polynomials. For example, okay. that's P2L of Z. Okay. And then that's defined to be this associated Laguerre polynomial. Okay, so if I want, I can write here, I could write that this is L2 um, L plus one half of Z. So could you write out that, just that one, just as an example, I'm sorry, I'm just a little bit slow in math. So if, if you write out that, that's a two and L plus half, right? Mm -hmm. So um, based on that formula you gave for L, I want to see how you get to that polyno polynomial in the parentheses. Um, it's a, it's just a definition. There's nothing there's nothing I can work out to show you. It's a definition, and th this is the definition. Right. So there's nothing there's no, there's nothing I can show you that would that would. Uh, there's nothing I can derive or formula I can plug in or do some algebra. It's just a, it's just a definition. Okay. Um, all right. So maybe it, it, it does turn out that there is an explicit form for the, the L's, which are also the P's. And so L K alpha of Z turns out to be one over K factorial Z to the minus alpha E to the Z K derivatives with respect to Z acting on E to the minus Z Z to the K plus alpha. So can, can we write? Yeah. Right. But that's, I, I, this is, this is a mathematical fact that I'm not proving and it does it's following from the definition and the recurrence relation. So there's no content in this formula that's different from the content that we had in the recursion relation for the P's. They're, they're the same formula. Okay, now this is a polynomial because I'm taking derivatives of, it, of an e to the minus z, which is going to give me some messy stuff, but still times e to the minus z, and then I'm multiplying by e to the z again. Okay, and so that's going to necessarily give a polynomial in Z. Okay, so they, they have that explicit form. Another thing that's nice about them is they satisfy, well, they satisfy the Schrodinger equation, really, but in the form of Laguerre's equation, which says Z two derivatives of Z plus one minus Z plus alpha. Alpha is L plus one half for us plus K. All of that differential operator acting on L K alpha is equal to zero. Okay, and then one more thing and then I guess we'll be done for today and talk and put everything together for next time is they satisfy an orthonormality condition.
okay, which says if we integrate over all z of z to the alpha e to the minus z times one Laguerre polynomial times a different Laguerre polynomial, so with the same alpha but a different k, that turns out to be gamma of k plus alpha plus one over k factorial, if and only if k and k prime are the same. Otherwise you get zero. Okay, so the way the normalization factors were chosen way back up here when we made our definition, okay, the way the re this wasn't completely crazy the reason for that choice was to make this choice be not too complicated. Now it turns out you could have made a different choice and you could have made a different choice on the coefficient just to make this thing be one. And maybe that would have been a good idea. But if we were to do that, then we would have a fourth uh, definition of the associated Laguerre polynomials. And we've already got three. So that would be one too many or two, three too many. So we're going to stick to a historically uh, one that's historically been made and just choose uh, our, our convention so that all of these equations are true. All right, so I went over time today. Sorry about that. But next time I will write down um, what this means again for the full wave function for the harmonic oscillator and sketch some radial wave functions to give you an idea of what they look like. And then we will be moving on to talk about the, um, the hydrogen atom, which also has associated Laguerre polynomials or generalized Laguerre polynomials in them, but a different set of them and appearing in a different way. But so there's this sort of magical thing that both the hydrogen atom and the isotropic harmonic oscillator involve the same equation, the Laguerre equation. All right, so we'll do that next time on Friday. Uh, don't forget that you have homework due on Friday. So if you have questions about that, uh, I'll be happy to answer them. All right, any other questions about today's lecture? Professor? Yeah. Okay, so, um, okay, so I substituted K equals two and alpha equals L plus a half for that LK alpha formula you gave, I did not get to that P2J. Um, so you, let's see if I got this right. So you've plugged into this, you've plugged in um, here. Yeah, yeah, I put the two for the K and the L plus half for the alpha. Good. And I, and I even did the derivative. And you did the two derivatives. Okay. And you did not get, you did not get this. No. I, okay. No, I did not. Could you please at least do one of them? Like, could you do that? The P2L, could you, could you do that, please? Could you just write down, like, could you substitute the L2 and L plus a half? So okay. How you got Thank sure. You. So this might take a while, so let me stop the recording here.